Welcome back to the Electronics Inside, the show where we tear down tools, toys and appliances just to find out what's inside. I'm David and in this episode, do you remember we looked at the BBC microcomputer from 1981 made by Acorn Computers? Well, Katie, everybody's favourite fidget cube making uh, video producer, has sent me her old Acorn A7000. About 15 years between them, let's see what's inside. Before we jump into the A7000, if you didn't already know, after we did the teardown on this, I actually did get it recapped to the power supply working again and fully restored to functioning purpose. If you want to see the video, it's over on the Element 14 community. If you're watching this on YouTube, I'll put a description down below. Go check it out. It's me messing around with a soldering iron and doing a fantastic job of getting almost nothing in focus. Still worth a watch though. So the A7000 came out in 1995, which is a solid 14 years after the BBC Micro. Now, Acorn was still persisting with the RISC OS project, but at the time they were rapidly losing ground to IBM compatibles and, let's face it, Windows 95. And this is up there with the last computers. There was the A7000 Plus. Unfortunately, in 1998, Acorn as a company went bust and sold off a lot of their assets, including their PC making and branch, which then became known as something completely separate. But this computer for its time was incredibly powerful and RISC OS was still supported and very, very strong for the time. But what I'm really interested in because I got my first Windows 95 machine in 1996, but of course it was an AT, an IBM AT based computer, which will be very different from the architecture of this, very different from the Toshiba laptops we looked at, but very similar age as well. So how does this front come off? Oh. So shielding is metal mounted on top of the case rather than just a plastic cover and we're in. Still got original hard drive and a floppy disk. I can't work out if the discoloration is just differences in plastic or whether that was actually a replacement floppy drive. Yeah. Now before Katie sent this to me she did say that the battery had leaked. She'd taken it out and cleaned it all up but it didn't work. It'd be interesting to know how bad that damage is. Maybe we can get the microscope out and identify that damage and have a look at how bad it is, see if it's well and truly scuppered. Floppy drive and hard disk. Oh, I wonder if Katie took everything she needed off the hard drive. I wonder what format the hard drive's in. I feel like I should know that. So there we go, there's the 36 pin floppy connector and the 40 pin hard drive connector versus SCSI and that weird Apple connector. Here's the hard drive and floppy drive assembly. Different size torque screws, of course. And we work this out straight away. <laughs> Just a little handwritten note. Works okay on an acorn. I'm sure it does. Ooh, perhaps did. Not sure what the capacity of that is though. I have to look that up, maybe even try and plug it in something else. I'm imagining that's small though. Anything 200, 500 megabytes, that kind of ballpark. Again, I don't imagine the floppy drive is anything special or unique. I'm pretty sure this is going to be an off-the-shelf Sony part. And yeah, that discoloration between the front of the bezel and the top. Yeah. Okay, so back in here, we've got expandable memory. I think this is actually memory as opposed to cache. Um, but this also had base memory on board, which I'm guessing these seem the chips down here. Got the optional network cards, which of course Katie had. I'm sure she had a 10 base uh, T Ethernet network in her home at the time. Got a very, very simplified power connector for the motherboard versus the double AT connectors that we've contemporary. Even ATX wasn't far away. That's the power and hard drive activity LEDs. There is, that must be a fix that Katie tried to implement to get a, a coin cell battery in replacement for the original leaked battery down here. Oof. Yeah, there's a lot of damage on this board. Here is the motherboard. 
very simple motherboard compared to my experience of things at the time. Oh, then you see down here, replacement battery must meet 91-157-EEC. And that's got BT1 next to it, battery one. Now, obviously that leak caused damage to the board and I would suggest these fly leads were introduced as a replacement to introduce a coin cell. And yeah, unfortunately that leaking has really done some damage. But what's weird is all of this corrosion over here as well. And just based on how that naturally sits, I'm half tempted to say the replacement coin cell also leaked over that side of the board. Could be wrong, but it looks possible to me. Should really turn this over so the uh, north, south, east, west is actually correct. So this board is weird because it actually had four meg of memory soldered on. Now this Siemens ICs down here are memory. They are on board DRAM, but it was expandable, which is this module here, uh, up to, I think it was like 128 meg of memory, which again, 1995 was a lot. I say that the uh, Macintosh SE30 also expandable to 128 meg and I thought that was a lot from the 1980s so what do I know. So down here we've got a couple of ROMs. Risk OS 3.6, Risk OS 3.6 so is that two banks of ROM to get the entire operating system on there which does mean this machine would boot without a hard drive which is always nice because the hard drives were optional extras. A very tidy board. It's such a shame that it's so damaged by corrosion. So this board natively had RS-232, uh, parallel port for printer, uh, re reset button, headphone connector, weirdly not audio out, um, video out, which I believe is SVGA. Then you have keyboard and mouse connectors. Now the network card. Now this is going to seem really weird to anybody probably born after 1990 even possibly. This coax connector used to be part of a network. Um, you have the normal RJ45 or 8P8C connector for Ethernet. Um, I think this is 10 base T, so very, very slow. Slower than the worst Wi-Fi, which started out at 11 meg, I think. But you also had this um, coaxial network, which was a, a, a ring topology. So you would have to have like a T connector and then a coax that went to the next computer came into this computer and the coax that went out to the next computer. Now, at the if you didn't have a complete ring, which was reasonably common, you had to have a terminator on the end to put a resistor between the, the two court, the conductor and the shielding of the coax. And we learned very quickly at school that if you undid any one of these BNCs and then didn't put a terminator on it, or there was a terminator and you took it off, you brought the whole network down, not just that computer. The whole lot went down. Yeah, that used to be the height of entertainment when one little push and twist would ruin an entire lesson's worth of computing. So the Acorn has a specialist high density connector for this bespoke motherboard. It's not PCI or ISA or it wouldn't have been AGP, which I'm not even sure AGP existed in 1995 and they've come afterwards. There you go, it just fits onto the motherboard there. They also have this extra expansion port, which I think was again bespoke to Acorn. Oh, interesting. There's a fan header on it. Right down here, you've got a fan connector. Why would you need a fan? The original release of the A7000 came with a 45 megahertz processor and it was all passively cooled. Why are they including on here a fan header? That doesn't make sense to me. Which I will say on the side of the case, we've got this square down here and that, that fan header would have been about here. So it's in the right sort of place and that would have taken an 80 millimeter fan about right, don't you think? Obviously it wasn't included at production, but looks like it was a possibility. Power supply, five volt, 4.4 amps at five volts, one amp at 12 volts and 0.1 at minus 12. So unlike ATX and AT motherboards, it doesn't have a 3.3 volt bus, which is strange, but yeah. On here, we've got that motherboard connector, two Molex for CD and hard drive, and then a floppy drive. They didn't, didn't give you a lot in terms of expansion, did they? And then again, I guess it wouldn't have all fitted in the case. This hard drive. Now, I'm, I'm not sure what format this hard drive would have been in. Works okay on an Acorn. Compact space, 120 megabyte hard drive. There you go. 120 megabytes. It's funny that I've got a six terabyte hard drive next door in the same form factor. Such a shame to see all this corrosion on the back of this board as well. I just don't understand because it seems to have started at two opposite ends and worked towards the centre of the computer. Another example of uh, the horizontal and vertical style of PCB layout on a dual layer board. So if we look at the front, all the traces run 
vertically north to south in terms of the compass. So all the traces on this side run principally front to back, and then on the back they all run east to west. I think what shocks me the absolute most about this computer, because bear in mind we're looking at the whole thing, not door to board cards removed. This would function on its own as it is as a computer. It's got memory, it's got the CPU, it's got the ROMs for the operating system. This was enough to get you going. And that seems absolutely minimal. This VLSI integrator is the ARM core as well as like, the peripheral controller for the board, in the most part anyway. As somebody that came from a generation of PCs at the time which had a CPU on a removable die, a separate cache on a stick, SIMs in sticks, hard drives so they could have windows on them. This seems absolutely crazy that you can get away with this few things on it. And I, I appreciate this was the, the cheaper budget option to the RISC PC, which did have more expansion slots that you could actually use with a CD-ROM at the same time and didn't clash in the case. But the fact that this worked as a package, that's an achievement right there. RISC OS and the Acorn A7000 were one of the last bastions of trying to hold on to that. But in 1998, with Acorn in financial trouble, everything changed. They ended up selling off parts of the business for intellectual property to try and continue servicing and supplying some of the parts. There's an interesting backstory into one of the parts which ended up going on to be bought and turned into a company called Element 14, not affiliated. As I think I said in the BBC Micro episode, Acorn Risk Machines, ARM, went on to license their intellectual property and their expertise in reduced instruction set computing, risk processors, to be what is largely found in most smartphones, apart from Intel's very quick attempt at uh, an x86 in a phone which didn't last very long. And you're starting to see a resurgence in that. There was the Microsoft Surface RT, which ran on AR ARM hardware. You've got the Apple M1 chip, which is not ARM intellectual property, but a very similar architecture. So it's really interesting that history's kind of gone, oh, we don't really want risk computing to, okay, let's talk about this seriously in the span of 25 years from obscurity to winning back the mainstream in a lot of ways. It's a real shame that this lovely piece of history has not survived in a way that makes it usable, but it's a risk that every old hardware runs with batteries and capacitors. If you've got an old bit of hardware that you've got stashed away somewhere that you are emotionally attached to, or you think might be rare, or even just you think might be interesting for somebody in the future, and you're not capable of recapping it, get it to someone who is. Let's keep as much of this hardware surviving as much as possible. That's why I try and repair or put back together the stuff I tear down, or I try and deliberately seek stuff which is unrepairable from the outset. I try not to waste anything. Either way, I hope you found this an interesting tear down. It's a sad story, but it's the way it goes sometimes. There is one thing I would like to ask the audience. Uh, if you've stuck around this long, thanks. Um, largely inspired by two recent releases. Um, there was a notable YouTube uh, presence who made an epoxy resin table out of some Game Boys, which made the news for various reasons, but also as part of the YouTube Secret Santa, Xyla Foxlin made a, an amazing epoxy resin table. I've never done anything with epoxy resin, but I would love to use some of the leftover bits from the electronics inside in one. And this table is actually one of the extendy ones. I can move these sides apart and put a blank in the middle. I'd love to make a, an epoxy resin and sort of encase some of these cannot ever be used again parts in there. Let me know if that's a project you'd like to see over at Element 14. Thanks for watching. Bye.